perception versus reality, outsize impact investment opportunities in the Caribbean. Our good friend, David Mullins, is the chairman and CEO of Blue Mahoy Capital Partners. Uh, David is a resilient entrepreneur who adopts much of his business savvy from a blend of philosophies from billionaires like Warren Buffett, CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, and mentor Michael Lee Chen, chairman of Portland Holdings. In his relentless pursuit of excellence, uh, he is widely read and lends his keen knowledge of entrepreneurship, business, and finance to a maraud of organizations both in the U.S. and Jamaica, uh, where he was born. Uh, he is the founder, CEO of Blue Mahoy Capital Partners, a Miami-based private investment firm focused on the Caribbean emerging markets. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to David and his colleague to begin our fireside chat and presentation. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aurelia Cruz, and I am the COO of Blue Mahoy Capital Partners. I'm here with David Mullins, and he'll tell you a little bit of, or about Blue Mahoy Capital Partners. So thank you very much for having us. Thanks for the introduction, Daniel. I'm David Mullings, as Aurelia said, and I'm pleased to have her. She's also a board member on our board of directors for Blue Moho Capital. Uh, we describe ourselves as a impact investment firm. Uh, we believe that there's opportunities for us to invest differently going forward. And it's important for us to actually measure the impact. Every investment has an impact, whether positive or negative. We think it's important to actually measure that. We're primarily focused on the Caribbean or entities that can positively affect the Caribbean. Great. Well, let's dig, let's dig in. In the title of this uh, breakout, you mentioned there's perception versus reality. Tell me a little bit more about what is the perception of the Caribbean and then tell me really about the reality. Well, one of the things I've learned from, you know, billionaire Jamaican Canadian investor Michael Leach in over the last 10 years is that to get excited about investing in an area, you, you need three things. The number one, perception should be different from reality. You need a lack of equity capital uh, flowing in uh, to that region. And then the final one is that uh, there should be inefficiencies. Inefficiencies must be present and they should be willing to correct them. On the perception versus reality side, you know, we've heard it a few times that there is a resort distort when it comes to the Caribbean. Uh, people think of sun and fun. Uh, they overlook the fact that billions of dollars of wealth have been created in the region, uh, that billions of dollars are flowing through the region. So the reality is that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity to invest in the region. There's also this perception because we talk about Latin America and the Caribbean, people focus on just Latin America, ignoring the small islands, thinking small island equals small return. We think that's obviously not true. But more importantly, they tend to think of you know, political risk, for example. Well, unlike with Brazil, Chile, elsewhere, the Caribbean typically has limited political risk. We've seen you know, orderly transition of governments since 1962 in Jamaica, for example. We've never had any issue for democratic elected governments. Uh, we've never had you know, military dictatorships. So those are issues that you know, prove that it's actually not as risky to invest down there. And, and the last one for us is the legal side. And the majority of the Caribbean is a British-based legal system or European-based. So we feel very comfortable standing in front of a judge in that region versus if you're investing, for example, in Southeast Asia or somewhere else. Okay. Um, so you mentioned also there are outsides impact opportunities. What are the kind of opportunities there that are in? The well, we think of the fact that if you invest in the region, it's a small region. It means that every investment can automatically have an outsized impact. Let's be honest, we can help to change entire economies. The COVID-19 pandemic has proven that unfortunately, a lot of these economies need to be diversified. They're too heavily focused on tourism or agriculture. And this is a lower value add side. So when you uh, deploy capital down there in a smart way, you can actually help these economies to uh, become more resilient. Uh, a simple example that you can think of is, is waste. Uh, you look at, uh, we have an island, uh, they're generating waste, and that's not going to change. Population is growing. And you put it into a landfill. Well, where is it going to go? Eventually, that waste is going to go into the ocean because you only have so much space. It's an island. Uh, that's where you could actually make an investment. We could do waste to energy. So you're helping to recycle, you're helping to reduce waste, and you're helping to lower the cost of energy. And that's just one. Obviously, the climate is an issue. Um, the United States is the only country in the world that's arguing whether or not climate change is real. But no one in the Caribbean is arguing about rising sea levels. They're seeing beach erosion. Uh, you can invest in there. And climate resilience is important. You know, right now today, we're seeing eruptions in St. Vincent. And you know, our prayers go for uh, all the people there. But 
is important. They are going to need to rebuild. There's going to be an opportunity to invest in infrastructure. But that means that you need to have more resilient infrastructure. We need affordable housing. We need financial inclusion. And you need technology. You know, we talk about work from home. Well, you know, work from home means work from anywhere. You, know, you don't have to just do call centers in the Caribbean. You could move up the value chain. You could do back office. In fact, you could do software development. Instead of going to India or going to the Ukraine, why not come to the English-speaking Caribbean? Yeah, we all enjoy visiting there, let's be honest. It's like a nearshoring. A nearshoring, a nearshore to the Caribbean instead. And you're going to save money. You're going to be contributing positively uh, to economies and you're helping to improve wages. And that's great. That is. Well, I, I know that we've been looking at several companies to invest in once the impact fund uh, launches. Can you give me some examples or maybe share just a little bit with the audience about some of the opportunities that you're looking at? Well, one opportunity, for example, we've acquired, I agreed to acquire 40% of a, a microfinance company. I've worked in that space before in Jamaica. Interest rates have come down and Jamaica has been a great example. You, you might think that these countries are, are highly indebted and so there's risk, there might be currency risk, but these exchange rates have been fairly stable. Uh, but interest rates, you know, thanks to Jamaica's two debt exchanges, went, uh, went from double digits to single digits. You know, 147% debt, debt to GDP ratio went down uh, to 97% and is heading to 60% over the next five years and is enshrined in law. So it's the opposite of Greece, definitely the opposite of Argentina. Uh, we all know that story. Well, you're paying 1% a week pretty much to borrow money as a small business or micro business in the Caribbean, Jamaica in particular. We can buy into Sprint. We can then get cheaper capital and unlend through them to micro and small business. An example is a farmer. If you are a farmer in Jamaica, and, and this is actually common, it's easy to get a loan to buy uh, the actual pickup truck to deliver the goods to the market than to buy the tractor to create the goods that you need to actually go and deliver. So we want to provide financing. We're partnering Sprint with a, a manufacturer and distributor to provide cheaper financing. That's one example. Second one is, is we have access to a company as a distillery based here in Miami. So we're willing to work with overseas companies who go into the region near to the border. Uh, the border. That would actually create over 500 jobs and both Haitians and Dominicans you know, would work together. Both presidents supported over 200 acres. U.S. market. That would be a start. That's the kind of impact I would have. And, and it's important to recognize that you wouldn't just create 500 jobs. That's 500 households that are now benefit, which means their children, their education. What does that mean? Not just impacting an individual. We're talking about impacting an entire ecosystem and that money. We want to make sure as much of it stays in the island as long as possible to get that multiplier effect. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Great. So I'm sure when people really dig in and find out more about the opportunities in the Caribbean, I think you've talked a lot about some good opportunities and specifically some that we're going to invest in. I'm sure everybody's going to want to run out and go invest in the Caribbean, right? So <laughs> would you recommend that? Well, so I wouldn't. You know, We know this. Most of the people who, who are watching this video attending the event have, have made money. You've created wealth or you manage wealth. And and you know that whenever you enter a new market, you're unfamiliar with the companies, the culture, the people, and probably the politics. You need a local partner. You don't want to just run into to Vietnam or to Chile or Brazil or Jamaica or Barbados. You never run in. You need local partners. There's a difference when somebody's born and raised in that region. And we know the people. We have relationships. We went to school with some of them, in fact. And so that, that is an advantage that we have. If you are globally aware, but you know, grounded in that region, then we think we become a really good partner. And then, of course, it's, it's actually ridiculously hard to invest down there. Uh, and this is on the, both the public and private side. If you want to open a bank account and you want it to go through a local entity, you have a fundamental problem. In Jamaica, it's five pieces of paper that you have to fill out. You need two letters of reference. I think you have to give them your ancestral DNA as well at this point, because it is that painful versus what we are used to in developed markets is log on online and within 15 minutes we're investing. So it is it is important that you partner with somebody who understands uh, the ground level, what's happening down there, but most importantly, who to do business with and who not to do business with. That's great. Well, I think we have time for um, questions. Are there any questions that anyone has for us? So no questions as yet. So we're going to keep going. Thank you.
right. Uh, so it says none yet here. Okay. Uh, right. So we are going to keep you know, keep okay. going. Any last comments that you would like to make that you think you would like to cover in terms of the opportunities in Caribbean? Well, I think that we need to recognize that the Caribbean is, is probably 20 years behind India, if you want to think about emerging markets and why it's important. We're talking about ESG and impact. What, what do those things even mean? Right? G is governance. So we think there's a, a huge opportunity with improving corporate governance amongst Caribbean companies, and we can bring that to them. Uh, there's a huge export opportunity, and that was one of the reasons people are going into India. But there's this democratization that is taking place. Uh, India 20 years ago sounds like the Caribbean today, where the government actually was a large owner of entities of businesses or wealthy families, a few wealthy families. And the government started divesting uh, some of those businesses in India. Uh, the wealthy families started listing their companies on public stock exchanges. That's exactly what has been happening in the region, Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, especially Jamaica. And in fact, Jamaica had the best performing stock exchange in the world between wow. 2013 and 2015, so for five years. Yeah. And in 2018 itself, Jamaica had the best performing stock exchange in the whole world. Vietnam was second, and then in fact, the United States was third. And this is in US dollar terms, not, not in Jamaica, not, we want to be clear about it, even with the exchange rate difference. So that democratization of wealth is creating new opportunities, and more people are investing a young population, growing population, highly educated, mainly in a British system as well. Uh, same time zone for the most part as the East Coast of the United States, major transshipment lanes. And Jamaica has the seventh largest natural harbor in the world. I keep trying to get people to think of Singapore and uh, be next door to a very large market. And Jamaica is perfect for that. The rest of the Caribbean can fit into that. But of course, you know, we have to recognize that industrial companies are there. They are, they are companies that we should consider multinational. They just happen to be headquartered in Jamaica, Bahamas, Barbados, Trinidad. Some of them are doing business in 50 countries. You know, wow. There's one listed Jamaican company that's doing business in the US, Canada, UK, Rwanda. There's, there's massive opportunities. But when we talk about ESG and impact, I think the word that we have to think about is, is, is non-white. We have to think about the fact that the majority of the world is non-white. The majority of the population to come is, is non-wide. So all businesses need to be thinking about investing in emerging markets if they want to be relevant in another generation. Instead of rushing over to Africa to do all the impact investing where you have a different legal system, language barriers, cultural barriers, come to the Caribbean first. We see that as a perfect R&D hub. Right. Test it there. It's smaller islands. It's easier to get you know, the government to work with you and not just regulations. Test, scale. And then move into Latin America, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. So as I see we have a, a question now, and this one says, what are key opportunities and challenges for emerging economies, uh, developing areas in the years ahead? How has COVID-19 played a role in these challenges? So, so I think you would have some ideas. I have some ideas about, about key challenges. I'll start. You know, one big challenge has been that debt overhang. It was, it was high debt whether it was you know, debt from Europe, from the UK, US, Canada, now China, as we know, uh, there was a debt overhang for a lot of these countries. Jamaica has dealt with that. Barbados is now dealing with that. Bahamas is dealing with that. So the debt won't be as much of an issue. So the government isn't crowding out markets anymore. So, so that's number one. Number two, though, is technology, uh, access to technology. Uh, they've been able to leapfrog, thankfully, thanks to mobile phones. We need to build on that. 5G is just rolling out in the region. There are a few years behind. So technology is going to be important. Especially we are, for um, online learning. For online learning. I mean, that's, that's a challenge that we've seen, right? There's, there's countries in the region who, because of the pandemic, had to shut schools around the world. Well, in the region, we had issues with, with telephony, with internet access, uh, rural internet access, or uh, people low in, uh, unfortunately, in the socioeconomic ladder were having issues. So this is tablets. We've seen tablet drives. And, and they have duties, they actually have duties on some of these things. So the, the, the governments need to wake up and realize that technology is the future. You cannot be charging duty on these items to come in to make your uh, people smarter. So we have a policy uh, challenge. We need uh, the leaders of today to recognize that they need to invest for tomorrow. They need policies to be for tomorrow. But the, the last one I would say as a challenge is mindset. We need to realize that we have to think globally. You shouldn't be only focused on the Jamaican market or the Barbadian market or Trinidad market. You need to think of being globally competitive. So that means you need to benchmark against international companies because we have international competition. Globalization is, is not going anywhere. It's not going to be reversed. So focus on comparative 
advantage within your economies and diversify away from tourism. Keep tourism. We're not saying you know, cold turkey, get rid of tourism, but uh, you need to invest in some other things. And it doesn't have to just be physical goods that you ship it. And when we look at something like Angry Birds uh, coming out of Europe, uh, come on, we, we can create digital goods. And we already do it though. Right? The largest export of the Jamaica is our culture. It is not bananas, it's not sugar, it's our culture, it's our music. Trade that is big on oil, great. They need to diversify as well. So let's, let's invest in some other things. So I think from an impact perspective, I think just even some of the things that you've talked about can make a huge impact very quickly. And imagine some of the other things that will happen once the region um, matures in terms of the economy. Yeah, and, and when you bring foreign capital in, and, and we think our, of ourselves as, as diaspora direct investment, not foreign direct investment, and the difference is important. When you look at the, the Asian financial crisis, this was FDI going into the region. And then what happened? They got spooked by one country, whether it's Thailand or so on. They get spooked and foreign investors pull their money. Yeah. Um, diaspora investors have more knowledge of the area. We are more risk tolerant. So because a hurricane shows up or a volcano erupts, we don't suddenly have capital flight. We're not pulling the money. And it's important to realize that these economies are capital friendly. And they're very capital friendly. It is very easy to move your US dollars or euros into the region and out of the region. Most of the countries are tax compliant. So you don't have to worry about are they blacklisted or not. So we don't have any issues with FATCA or those things that we worried about or the EU. But the key thing is how do you do it? You need vehicles to be able to invest here. Just because you're, you want to get into a region and you're not going to do a direct investment. Family offices love doing direct investments. I wouldn't recommend that in the Caribbean. We don't have many funds. I think it's a total of three funds that, that call themselves impact funds that focus on just the Caribbean. Most people are obsessed with Latin America, the larger population. Now, we are different in, in what we are doing. We invest from our balance sheet and we're launching our own impact fund. And the idea behind that is that we can invest in, in equities. It's an equities portfolio, and that's both listed and non-listed. There's more wealth creation and value creation by investing in a private company but then helping it to go public. We want to democratize wealth and ensure that, that locals can participate in that wealth creation. So most funds would only do one or the other. We can do both. We are willing to do joint ventures with overseas-based companies who want to go into the region and contribute because all the ideas, all the solutions can't come from one region. Uh, we need to be careful about being too home biased. And so we see that as a great opportunity. We don't only want to buy control. We're willing to do up to less than 20%, and we could take control, but we'd prefer not to do a controlled investment in the fund. We take board seats. Uh, we are what we call catalytic investors. We want to help these companies to scale. So better corporate governance. We want to improve their access to technology, which means that we, we make them more efficient. But that also means that we increase labor productivity. That has been a big problem in the region. So we're excited about doing that. So let's see, are there any, any other questions? We see a question, what are the best ways for global family offices and global stakeholders to incentivize government to remove red tape and also improve regional cooperation to make local and regional investments easier? We need to talk to them. We need to do more events where we invite those leaders and we need to basically show them what has happened in other regions. When you look at how China has grown, how India has grown, Brazil, we need to simply show, and Vietnam is a great example. And I bring up Singapore a whole lot because that basically set the model for small, small countries. But that's what we need to do. We actually need to host an event and I'm happy to help coordinate that and bring some of these prime ministers and policymakers, policy advisors in the room and show them how we can be additive uh, to growing their economies and helping to, to lift more people out of poverty. It's been done. I think showing the yeah. demand and showing there is a, a huge interest. And I think what we're be, we'll be doing with the um, with the fund will be able to show that people are interested in the region. And I think from there, the demand will um, yeah. prove to be a catalyst. No, it will. And, and so we're excited for what we're doing. And we're excited to keep telling that story and showing people uh, what exists in the region and the return opportunities uh, with minimizing downside risk. Uh, that's a big part of what we care about is minimizing downside risk. So, you know, join us on this journey and we look forward. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you.